welcome everyone the first session of the last day uh, we will continue our discussion there was one lecture that I gave on some research directions and some of the work that we had done namely elliptic curve cryptography optimizations minimizing the number of additions and minimizing the number of curve additions and we call that work optimizing elliptic curve scalar multiplication with near factorization we now look at another thing that we have done so there were many questions about what are the possible attacks on elliptic curve cryptography on AES and so on and so forth so one of the important classes of attacks that has become uh, particularly important and explored well in the recent past are what are called side channel attacks side channel attacks can be due to various reasons they could be timing based side channel attacks they could be power based side channel attacks they could be cache based side channel attacks and so on and so forth and we have looked at actually many of these things over here my students have been working on it now for about two years or so and uh, one of the things that we looked at quite extensively was cache based side channel attacks and in particular those that target uh, AES so uh, with that little background let us now move on to how exactly we can attack AES but before we attack AES let us just recall all the different steps over here so the two very important things before we begin the attack the first is to recall the different steps in AES and then how is it actually implemented in software like OpenSSL for example so the kinds of software that you use maybe in your browser or wherever else to do encryption and decryption will actually implement it in a very interesting and very efficient way so of course you can have both implementations software based implementations and hardware based implementations so there are many modern processors that actually implement some of these crypto algorithms and actually in hardware so you will see the modern processors will implement AES for example in hardware but also we implement it in software so OpenSSL is one example of a software implementation so we need to look at the details of this implementation and some basics of cache memories before we see a cache based side channel attack so I will be going through this a little slowly and uh, repeating certain things just to make it clear this is one of the uh, more advanced lectures uh, a research oriented lecture because I thought this is an audience of faculty around the country and as faculty some of you have done a PhD some of you are planning to do a PhD perhaps you are supervising um, BE students and some of you have MTech programs also you are supervising MTech students and a few colleges may even have PhD programs where uh, students are looking for areas to research on so the, the re reason for this lecture and the goal of this lecture is actually this lecture and one or two of the previous lectures Professor Virendra Singh also had a lecture on actually hardware implementations for detecting malware in packet payloads and I had an earlier lecture on elliptic curve optimization this is another lecture now on um, side channel attacks targeting AES so I will talk about the basics of AES first some recall some of it then from the basics we will go to how it is implemented and then the attack proper so the implementation as you will see is extremely interesting so this is a special attack there are mathematical attacks as mentioned before there are attacks on the mathematical foundations of certain crypto algorithms for example in the case of RSA RSA depends on the hardness of factorizing a large number that is the product of two large primes so that is the hard mathematical problem in the case of RSA in the case of Diffie-Hellman and uh, uh, elliptic curve cryptography uh, the hard problem is the discrete log problem so the discrete log problem which I have already talked about and the EC discrete log problem now in addition to these hard mathematical problems there are these attacks based on side channels that is what information can you get from a side channel basically the algorithm is being implemented on a server or a laptop or even a smart card and you are trying to get timing information and you are using that timing information or the power information how much power is consumed as a function of time you are using that information to actually uh, reveal certain bits of the key so this is the whole idea over here now a summary of AES I do not know whether it is very clear to the audience what is going on on this slide because it is a very busy slide uh, we said there were 10 different uh, rounds or stages and each round had four steps 
so this is sort of like round 0 the initial round which only involves a round key operation so recall that a round key is a, is something that's obtained from the original key there is something called as key schedule you look at the text for details of this how to obtain each of these round keys from the original key so the first sort of the, before the actual round begins so this is an actual round with the four steps before that round there is a simple add key add round key operation over here and then the first round and the subsequent rounds so there are nine such rounds and then one final round that has one missing step so these four rounds are actually byte substitution shift rows mix columns and add round key these are the four steps in each round and these will go on for nine rounds and then in the final round there is only sub, uh, byte substitution shift rows and add round key there is no mix column operation in the last round a more formal definition of each of these rounds now follows byte substitution that is the first step we use a 16 by 16 s box where the i jth entry sij is mathematically this thing you take the value of i so as we had seen before to recall so let me just draw this picture so you represent the plain text which is 128 bits by a matrix a 4 by 4 matrix and each of these each element in this matrix is actually a byte and a byte is of course two hex characters so why is it a byte because each of these is an element of this field gf 2 raised to 8 each element is represented as 8 bits for example this thing so in hexadecimal this is the number 10 and this is the number 11 so 11 a b and so on and so forth so to clarify the input to every round is a matrix like this in fact the input to every uh, step in a round every operation in a round is a matrix just like this the matrix is a matrix of bytes each byte is represented as two hexadecimal characters now what you do in the substitution step is that you take these each of these things and you substitute for some other value and you use something called the s box the s box is a 16 by 16 table and again each table is a byte two hex characters now how do i use this s box i take this ab and i use the first element as the index as the row index so i look at the eighth row so a is 10 for example so i look at the 10th row here so 0 1 2 etc right up to f i look at the eighth row and then i look at the bth column so 0 1 2 etc right up to f where I, where I find the bth column and this is the element I would look at so I substitute a b for this element so this is the byte substitution step now how exactly did I get this matrix so just a little bit of detail on that it is not a terribly important detail but if you are getting into research and so on then you might want to know how did those entries come about the ijth entry sij is you take i and then you take j so i is a hex character sort of 4 bits 4 bits so you get 8 bits over here which is a field element and you take the inverse of that field element the multiplicative inverse of that field element and then you exclusive or it with 63h so 63 exclusive or with that and that is the element that sits over there so ij is a concatenation of i and j represented as binary as a binary string and ij inverse is the multiplicative inverse of ij in this particular field so operations are defined in this field by the irreducible polynomial x raised to 8 plus x raised to 4 plus x cube plus x plus 1 and because 0 0 does not have an inverse the entry in row 0 column 0 is actually not using doesn't use this thing but actually is just simply the element 63 
So let the ijth entry in the state matrix be x y just like we had a b in that picture that I just showed you there will be x y where x and y are hex digits then this step involves substitution of the ijth entry by the element in row x and column y of this substitution table. Then the next step is a row shift. So each element in the ith row i lying between 0 and 3 of the state array undergoes a left circular shift of i positions. So in row 0 nothing is shifted, in row 1 everything is shifted left by one position. So recall these things it will be important when we try to write down the implementation. The third row is shifted by two positions and the last row is shifted by three positions to the left and it is a circular shift. So the row shift causes bytes in a column to be diffused amongst other columns. So there are these two uh, principles of, prin of confusion and diffusion. So the permutations actually help in diffusing things. Now the next step is column mixing. So the original state is pre multiplied by this matrix 0 2. So this column is 0 2 0 1 0 1 0 3 and so on. So they are all actually shifts of one another as you can see this thing is shifted uh, right by one position and then uh, again it's shifted right and so on. So this is a matrix the important thing to note is that these are not simple arithmetic numbers but these are actually field elements. So this field element is actually 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 that is this field element and so on and so forth. So you actually uh, multiply that so called state matrix that 4 by 4 matrix that I told you that 4 by 4 matrix goes around initially it is populated by the 128 bit plain text and it keeps getting transformed as it goes from stage to stage and also from step from one step to the other step within a particular stage. So initially it starts out with something and then it uh, that thing gets substituted each element there gets substituted then there is a row shift and now we come to the third step where that matrix is multiplied by this thing and this and the product becomes the output of this step called column mixing. Now the interesting thing and you can just verify it it is something that you should observe very carefully it will take you some time to notice this and that is after a few rounds what is the meaning of few maybe two rounds after a few rounds an output will depend on all the inputs. So there will be a tremendous amount of diffusion making the hackers job difficult and then finally the fourth step round key addition. Each round has a separate key obtained from the original key using a key expansion algorithm. So that key expansion or key schedule is all de defined in the text we would not actually deal with it too much over here. So each round key is obtained from the original key it is exclusive odd with the current state to obtain the next state. So this is a simple uh, transformation where you just represent the round key as a 4 by 4 matrix and you exclusive or with the input to this particular step step 4. So now uh, to understand our attacks so we have uh, implemented actually and implemented fairly successfully it has taken us a long time to do it uh, actually at least about a year and a half because these attacks are extremely complicated and the more the, the newer the machine the worse the, the complication is. Uh, we started off with uh, Intel dual core but we have also tried to look at i3 and i4. So attempts at designing and implementing uh, side channel attacks. So we have implemented this cache based side channel attack and these are some of the machines that we have targeted. We will also be targeting the uh, Atom machine and the um, and some more machines from uh, Spark and so on. So right now we have got results for some of these Intel dual core, Intel i3 also i5 and i7 and these machines have 4 cores. Now the actual implementation of AES so it is important to really understand how this implementation uh, how this thing has been implemented in software and in a very efficient fashion to uh, obviate the need for expensive field operations. So although what I just told you the AES operations used field arithmetic and if we know how to do field multiplication etc we can easily see how to implement this I mean we can actually implement it using field operations and software but that is not very efficient. So although AES operations use field arithmetic the actual software implementation uses extensively ex makes extensive use of table lookups. So it turns out that there are 4 tables we will call them T0, T1, T2, T3 
and each of these is 1 kilobytes. So actually that corresponds to 256 entries of 4 bytes each. And there is some information over here that is relevant to the attack because these are the targeted machines. So we use the Intel dual core a unified L1 cache. So what does this have? The Intel dual core has only two levels of cache L1 cache and L2 cache and the first one is 32 kilobytes so it is a unified that is to say data and instruction cache are in the same thing there is no, not separate uh, data and instruction caches and then there is an L2 cache which is quite big 2 megabytes and it is 8 way set associative. So I will explain some of these things because they are important to really appreciate the attack what is exactly meant by saying it is 8 way set associative and so on and then the Intel i3 which is a 4 core machine and now this has actually 3 levels of cache a separate i cache and a separate d cache each of which is 32 kilobytes then you have an L2 cache which is 256 kilobytes shared between P0 and P2 and another shared one between P1 and P3 and they are each 8 way set associative and then there is an L3 cache which is shared by all 4 cores and that is 3 megabytes and the other important parameter of these caches is all of them have a block size of 64 bytes. So let us try to understand exactly how this uh, cache is organized. So we will get back to one picture over here. This is main memory and this is your cache much smaller than main memory. main memory might be say 4 GB and this thing is if we take uh, L2 cache um, let us say 256 kilobytes for example in the case of Intel i3 now visualize this thing as being made up of lines like this So this thing is referred to as a cache block or a cache line so if you start with the first block of main memory let us say this is the first block then this gets mapped to this location the second one gets mapped to this location and so on and so forth and then you go on this way and then this one so this one over here gets mapped to this location and you go on like this in round robin fashion this one again gets mapped to the first line of cache and so on and so forth. So there will be many blocks over here of main memory that map to the same line in cache. Okay, so this is a example of a actually this is like a direct map cache now uh, one of the things is the block size it is 64 bytes now in an 8 way set associative cache there will actually be instead of this picture there will actually be several lines inside a set there will be 8 lines inside a set so let me uh, draw a picture of an 8 way so this would be something called a direct mapped cache which is one way set associative now the one that we are targeting is actually an 8 way uh, set associative cache how does it differ from this one Now I have got sets over here and each set has got 8 lines so the first line maps to it does not map to a line this line of main memory does not map to a line it maps to the end to the set it can be anywhere inside the set 
so you go on this way now the second line will map to the second set and so on this line will map to this set notice it maps to a set not to a particular line as in the previous diagram so this line if it is in cache it will be somewhere inside this set it can't be in any other set it has to be in this set but it can be in any one of those eight positions the next line has to be in one of those eight positions in the next set and so on and so forth so this is eight way set associative once again the block size over here is 64 bytes and the question is in this case how many line, how many different sets exist So the number of sets is the cache size divided out by the block size times the associativity. So C is the cache size, B is the block size and A is the associativity. And Intel i3 for example I just substitute the numbers to get the number of sets. I had 256 kilobytes so that is 2 raised to 18 divided out by the block size 64 that is 2 raised to 6 and the associativity 8 which is 2 raised to 3. So this turns out to be the number of sets is 2 raised to 9 which is 512 so let us just keep some of these things in mind and how we got these numbers so we will look at the maximum time to access a line in each set as we go on in this thing so we now see that the number of sets in the Intel i3 machine the number of sets in the L2 cache is 512 this is an L2 Okay, so with this this background let us continue let us just recap the our targets are we try to attack two different machines Intel dual core with this configuration and Intel i3 with which has four cores a separate i cache and d cache at level 1 32 kilobytes the one I am most interested in is this one L2 cache with 256 kilobytes. So this is one number that we should keep at the back of our minds the next number is the block size the block is basically the granularity of transfer between cache and main memory or between L1 cache and L2 cache you never transfer just half a line you will always transfer a full line or you may transfer two lines but you will never transfer one fourth of a line or half a line and so on. So this is the granularity of transfer between cache and main memory. Okay, anything else this is 256 kilobyte and the other important thing is that the uh, at least these two caches are both 8 way set associative. So that gives us the number of sets as I just showed you on that picture. Okay, now we need to understand something about these AES tables they are going to be put in cache right. So when the we are going to assume over here that you have got an attacker and a victim the victim is implementing AES he keeps implementing AES again and again and again what is he doing with AES think of the victim as being a database service provider or an archival storage provider he takes things from his client his customers things like certificates say your uh, school leaving certificate or your degree certificate of your B or B tech degree and so on and you want to save it and store it someplace so he takes all those certificates transcripts whatever you want to be stored securely he takes it and he stores it and there is no reason why he should store your certificates with a different key from somebody else only he can access that storage whoever gives him his certificates and uh, other documents to store he stores in that same storage with one special key and that is the AES key and now it turns out that to implement his AES so the victim once again is implementing AES and the attacker is essentially he has got a very large array that he initializes 
and he reads and he writes from that array. So the victim is the guy who is implementing AES. For AES, you need a total of 4 kilobytes T0, T1, T2, T3. We will see exactly what those tables are and what do they contain. These tables are placed back to back in virtual memory. Now if there are 4 kilobytes immediately from the uh, information that we have got, we will see that they will occupy a total of 64 cache blocks. So there are 4 tables, we will see how those tables are used T0, T1, T2, T3, but they occupy a total of 4 kilobytes, which coincidentally also tallies or uh, matches with the page size in these machines. So we will see of the, the significance of that in a while. So 4 kilobytes for these tables and why do they occupy 64 blocks because each block is itself uh, 64 bytes. So that is 2 raised to 6 multiplied by 2 raised to 6, 64 blocks each block itself is uh, 64 bytes. So the total is 2 raised to 6 multiplied by 2 raised to 6, 2 raised to 12 which is 4 kilobytes. There are also 16 blocks per table, there are 4 tables, 64 uh, cache blocks each table has got 16 blocks and then within each block, so I use the word block and line interchangeably. So each block or each line of cache has got 16 elements, why because each element is 4 bytes long, the size of the element of that field. So each element is actually, uh, actually it has got 4 elements, so each, each of these elements of this table, these two, 4 tables T0, T1, T2, T3, T3, each of those elements is actually 4, four bytes, so it is actually 4 field elements and because the cache block size is 64 bytes, there are 16 elements on each line or each block of cache. Now for each block of plain text to be encrypted, all 4 tables need to be accessed, but it turns out that not each block of a particular table is accessed. Now what exactly are those tables T0, T1, T2, T3 we will uh, demonstrate next. To attack uh, the software implementation of AES, we have to first know how it is actually implemented. So what is going on? Now recall there is one step where we use uh, the multiplication, the field multiplication, the two matrices and uh, I will just write down those values, this is from a previous slide. So this matrix has to be multiplied by the matrix which is the input to the column mixing step. Now what is the input? So briefly we recall there were 4 steps, we started out with byte substitution, then row shifting, column mixing and round key addition, 4 steps. We can interchange those first 2 steps, so let us say we started with um, row shifting first, there is no problem you can just convince yourself that I can interchange the order of the 2 steps, I can start with row shifting and then move to um, byte substitution. So if I have shifted then the, this matrix will look like So instead of putting x0, x1, x2, x3, 
it is more convenient to write down x0, x1, x2, x3. Now if I have shifted it by uh, to the left by one position then this thing will become 5 everybody sees that right. So I shifted by left uh, shifted by one position to the left so the x5 from here goes there. So I am going to do this this is the output of the row shift so I get x5 over here. I am just shifting all these uh, indices to the left. So I get 5 here then 9 then D and then 1. So I will just read this this is X0, X4, X8 and Xc because I am writing this down not in, in row major fashion but in column major fashion. Then the next thing is shifted by two positions. So what am I doing now this is a particular round I have finished the first operation I just cheated a little bit I started with shifting rather than substitution and there is a reason for this before I told you it is first substitution then shift then column mixing round key addition what I am doing over here is I am doing the shift first once I do the shift then this matrix which had x0 the original matrix had x0 x4 x8 xc x1 x5 and so on now become looks like this it is x0 x4 x8 xc x5 x9 xd x1 and so on. So this is what the matrix looks like after the shift and now I want to get the new matrix what I have to do for that and this is the interesting thing instead of actually multiplying it like this so actually I would have to take this element x0 which is a field element. 8 bits or 2 hex characters I have to take it look into that S, S matrix and then replace that value over here similarly replace this thing and so on and so forth and once I have replaced all those elements then I will do the field multiplication of these two matrices. So let me repeat the first step that I did over here was row shifting after I did row shifting I got this matrix now I have to do byte substitution what that actually involves is taking this element and substituting it from another element from that 16 by 16 S box but I am going to play another game I am going to be very very efficient as efficient as I can and what I do is I use this as an index so I take x0 and I use it as an index into a table let us call it table t0 that gives me the value so in table t0 So there is this table T0 which has a total of 256 elements and each element is actually 4 bytes. And guess what those 4 bytes are so for example if I take x0 over here then I use x0 as an index into this table and what I get over here these 4 bytes are actually x0 multiplied by 0 2 again field multiplication not the normal multiplication x0 multiplied by 0 2 x0 multiplied by 0 1 x0 multiplied by 0 1 and x0 multiplied by 0 3 so that 0 1 occurs twice. So once again in this table t0 the entry in the x 0th row is the concatenation of 4 bytes the first byte is x 0 multiplied by 0 2 x 0 multiplied by 0 1 x 0 multiplied by 0 1 and x 0 multiplied by 0 3 which sits down over here this is the row indexed by x 0. Then to look at so this is what I get okay so I am going to do a table lookup looking at table t 0 instead of doing that substitution and multiplication I am going to make it very efficient 
for each entry say x0 I will look at table t0 and from that table t0 I will get x0 multiplied by 0 2 x0 multiplied by 0 1 x0 multiplied by 0 1 and x0 multiplied by 0 3 by looking at the x 0th row of this table. This table has got 256 rows and each row has got 32 bits. So I can write a very nice assembly language instruction to actually pick out those 32 bits and send it through my data bus into the CPU. And those four uh, bytes, 32 bits is four bytes, those four bytes are actually those things that I just mentioned, x0 multiplied by this, x0 multiplied by 1, x0 multiplied by 1 and x0 multiplied by 3. So that is the first thing I get. I am doing one table lookup and I am picking up in one shot, I am picking up all these four entries. Then the next thing I do is I look at x5 and guess what I do now? I look at x5 and I look at table t1, a very similar looking table of 256 elements but in this table, so I look, I use x5 as an index into this table and in this table guess what I have? I will have x5 multiplied by 0 3, look at the second column now, x5 multiplied by 0 3, x5 multiplied by 0 2, x5 multiplied by 0 1, x5 multiplied by 0 1. So once again one assembly language instruction where I use an x5 to as an index into table t1 and I pick out these four bytes, these four bytes over here. Then I use x a, x a as an index into another table t3 and what does that table contain? Now you can guess what it contains. If I take x a, that table contains x a multiplied by 0 1, x a multiplied by 0 3, x a multiplied by 0 2 and x a multiplied by 0 1. I am looking at now the third column inside this. So the first row of T3 will be the first row, so the 0th row will be 0 multiplied by 0 1, 0 multiplied by 0 3, 0 multiplied by 0 2, 0, uh, 0 multiplied by 0 1. Those will be the first, the first element of T3. The x a th element of T3, x a th element of T3 will be x a multiplied by 0 1, x a multiplied by 0 3, x a multiplied by 0 2 and x a multiplied by 0 1. And the final thing is I use x f into a fourth table and that table is T4 and that table contains each element starting with the 0th element, first element and so on, 0th element multiplied by so 0 0 multiplied by 0 1, 0 0 multiplied by 0 1, 0 0 multiplied by 0 3 and 0 0 multiplied by 0 2. So in that table now which is table T0, T1, this is T2 I am sorry, T2 over here and table T3 I will use xf into as an index into table T3 to pull out in one assembly language instruction I will put out, pull out xf multiplied by 0 1, xf multiplied by 0 1, these are all concatenated in one word of the processor. So I pull out all of that thing and lo and behold I have got xf multiplied by all of these. Uh, slight change, it is not actually xf multiplied by all of these, it is xf after you do the substitution, do not forget that all of this stuff that we are talking about right now subsumes two operations. You are killing two birds in one stone, in one stone you have hit substitution as well as the multiplication. So uh, I get actually uh, in the first uh, access to T0, the x 0th row of T0 is actually the substitute, perform a substitution in x0 using the S box, all that is taken care of. The table will actually reflect all of these things, that is x0 perform a substitution on, S, uh, on x0 using the uh, S box and then multiply and then multiply by 0 2, 0 1, 0 1, 0 3 all of that contained in one single row the x 0th row of t0. So by, by these table accesses and it is important now to see how many table accesses I have done, for each element I will do one table access. So as you might guess now x0 is used as an index into table t0, x5 into table t1, 
x a into table t 2 and x f into table t 3. And what do I do when I get all those words from memory from cache memory now I will actually add them and when I say add I mean the field add which is an exclusive or. So this thing is equal to so this is the output matrix of which round of the third round. So the first round was substitution then the row shift we have changed it actually interchanged it we have made it row shift without any problem. So the row shift was first so that is reflected in these indices then the substitution and then the multiplication both substitution and multiplication this matrix multiplication which is a field element of fields this has both been subsumed in just table lookups. So in just a total of for each element I must do one table lookup. So for element this thing x0 I must look into table t0 for this thing I must look into table t1 for this thing into table t2 for this thing into table t3 and I simply add those entries exclusive or that is to say those uh, concatenation of four, 4 bytes whatever came out of the table say this thing came out of the table I take this and I add it to this thing simply exclusive or and that I add to this one whatever was that x a th thing add it to this and then the x f it this guy x f it entry in table t 3 and to complete that round I need to exclusive or further with the round key. So in just 4 table lookups and doing these exclusive or operations guess what I have obtained this entire this entire column. I do exactly the same thing now with x4 x4 again I use that as an index into t0 I use x9 as an index into t1 this thing as an index into t2 and this thing as an index into t3 and I once I pull out all of these things in 4 assembly language instructions the next thing I do is exclusive or all of them and then exclusive or with the round key and then I get the next column and the next column and the next column. So basically what I am doing is I am doing 16 memory accesses and almost certainly those accesses are going to be in to cache. So 16 accesses in cache. So I have got now tables T0, T1, T2, T3 let us see how they would be organized in cache. But before that we will just very quickly to understand the notation we will just show you one slide where all of this thing appears on one slide. Okay, I hope this thing is visible to the people uh, to all the participants otherwise I will just read, read out from it. So it is a nice summary slide. So this is from my students MTP presentation. So there are 4 tables each table each taking 8 bit input and giving 4 byte output. So there are 4 tables what are those tables called T0, T1, T2, T3. What do you provide as input to the table? you provide one of those x 0's or x 1 or x a or whatever. So those are basically elements of that state array. So one element at a time. So you provide one of those elements to table t 0 as I have shown and then so that is an 8 bit input that means there are 2 raised to 8 possible indices from 0 through 255. So that x 0 serves as an index into this table t 0 the other one below it would serve as an index into table t1 so that is why we say 4 tables each one taking 8 bit input and do not forget the output is an interesting 4 byte quantity in one single shot you are getting 4 bytes that you needed 32 bit word. So this can very nicely come through one uh, assembly language instruction into your CPU. The size of each table is 1 kilobyte why because there are 2 raised to 8 entries in that table 2 raised to 8 is 256 multiplied by 4 bytes that gives you 1 kilobyte and those 4 tables almost certainly when you write your program and you define those 4 tables t0, t1, t2, t3 they will be adjacent to each other in virtual memory and the 4 tables together 1 kilobyte, 1 kilobyte, 1 kilobyte, 4 kilobytes almost certainly would occupy one page 4 kilobyte page the default page size on most of these machines is 4 kilobytes. The constants, constants of the table is known to all so we can derive those constants very easily basically that table is derived from the substitution box and from after you do those mathematical operations but that is already done for you. So those 4 tables are populated how do you get values in those 4 tables 
by looking at the substitution box and by doing the field operation. So that is already done for you, you don't have to do it again and again. You just it's done once and for all and every time you run AES you simply use those tables. You do not need to look at the substitution box, you don't have to do the field operation that is the multiplication by 0, 02 and 0, 03 and so on. Now this very nicely summarizes a particular column in a round. So this is the first column of the output of that particular round. So what is that column? The first column it is T0 if you remember the notation I am looking at X0 and I use that as an index into table T0. Just imagine the beauty of this implementation X0 is used as an index into table T0. In just one assembly language instruction I pulled out this 32 bit quantity each element in each these tables is 32 bits. Then I look at X5 why X5 and not X4 because it has been shifted. So I look at X5 and take and use that as an index into table T1 and I get a 32 bit quantity again. So one 32 bit quantity another 32 bit quantity then I look at table T2 and again shifted twice was the value X10. I use that in, as an index into table T2 and then this thing shifted three times X15 and that is an index into table T3. All of these are 32 bit words are exclusive or all of them in a couple of assembly language instructions and the corresponding 32 bits of the round key. So the round key itself is so this K0 stands for the 0th column of the round key. Again the round key can be thought of as a 128 bit entity and the first column would be 32 bits. So each of these things is 32 bits think of it as 32 bit words they are all exclusive word and lo and behold I have got the entire first column of the output matrix in this round. So E0 that is 32 bits or 4 bytes or 4 field elements and then if you can read this thing it actually gets into a little bit more detail. So the R plus 1 superscript stands for round R plus 1. So round R plus 1 X 0 th element X 1 X 2 X 3 so th this is the first column basically expansion of this thing in terms of the actual um, elements. So X 0 R plus 1 is the uh, first element of the output matrix that is to say the output of round R or the input to round R plus 1. Then this is the second element of the matrix which is uh, the input to round R plus 1. So these are the inputs to round R plus 1 and these are the inputs to round R. So from the inputs to round R you get the inputs to round R plus 1 and exactly using this thing. So this is for the first column of the matrix this is for the second column the third column and the fourth column. So this is a standard implementation used in almost anywhere where you implement uh, AES and software for example the open SSL uh, library. So to recap there are 4 AES tables each 1 kilobyte so total of 4 kilobytes they are placed back to back in virtual memory. They occupy a total of 64 cache blocks 16 blocks per table and 16 elements per block. So let us just clarify all this each element on the table is 4 bytes each block is 64 bytes on most machines. So therefore there must be if the each element is 4 bytes there must be 16 elements per block. Now 16 elements per block there are total of 256 elements per table. So there must be 16 cache blocks corresponding to table T0, 16 cache blocks corresponding to table T1, 16 to T2 and 16 to T3 for a total of 64 cache blocks. For each block of plain text to be encrypted all 4 tables need to be accessed. So let us focus on doing uh, one particular round of AES then we require 16 accesses. If you do the entire encryption you require 10 of these things so 16 multiplied by 10 160 accesses to these tables. So let us try to see now each table will be accessed but the interesting thing is that there is no guarantee that every single line in a particular table is accessed. So 
So for example, take table T0. Table T0 will be accessed how many times? In each round, just recall, in each round, table T0 will be accessed four times, guaranteed. Table T1 will be accessed four times, T2 four times, T3 four times. But there is no guarantee that if you take all of the rounds, which is a total of um, four multiplied by 10, that is 40 accesses to T0, you cannot guarantee that every block of T0 will be accessed. There are 16 blocks in T0 because there are a total of 64 cash blocks. So 16 blocks for T0 and how many times you are accessing T0, you are accessing it 4 multiplied by 10. Each round 4 and there are 10 rounds, so 40 times. But that does not guarantee that each of those 16 blocks are going to be accessed. And that is the heart of the attack, to figure out which blocks are not accessed. So most of those blocks, those 16 blocks in T0 will be accessed. But based on what is not accessed, you can try to get valuable hints as to what is the key. So not each block of a table is accessed. Figuring out, and how do I figure out? By cache accesses, I will actually access the cache as the attacker to see which block takes me more time to access and which is less time. So the fact is, not each block of the table is accessed. So if I can figure out which block of the table is not accessed or which blocks are not accessed, so out of those 64 blocks, statistically speaking, about three or four will not be accessed. And that will give me valuable clues as to what is the encryption key. So this idea has come up from a paper by Shamir and others. So this is the main idea again. By identifying which blocks of the tables are not accessed, valuable information about certain bits of the AES key can be deduced. An attacker will be able to bring down the complexity of an attack on AES from this. If you use a brute force attack, then because the AES key is 128 bits, the complexity of that, of that attack is around 2 raised to 128. You can bring it down from 2 raised to 128 to around 2 raised to 48 by using a cache based side channel attack. Okay, so now what is the actual attack? Finding the location of the AES tables approach 1. So access SW blocks using the attacker's list of pointers to get the cache completely occupied. So what the attacker is going to try to do is he is going to target L2 cache, he is going to completely write into every block, not every byte, but every block. He is going to try to access each of the blocks inside L2 cache. Uh, over here the notation is S is the number of sets and W is the associativity. So that is it, he will do this, then he will give control, he will impart control to the victim. So as I said before, the victim is just doing encryption after encryption after encryption. So the victim performs AES encryption to bring all of those blocks, those 64 blocks. He is going to use almost all of those blocks. So those blocks are going to be brought into cache. And the next thing is, for each set, access W blocks which map to it. So if there are S sets inside this cache, then you iterate for each set you access the W blocks which map to it. So basically the attacker now in this step, he's also accessing the W blocks. He records what is the maximum time to access. So amongst those W blocks that belong to a given set, he looks at the access time for each block and he computes the maximum time. And that is what we are going to plot. So now this is for the Intel i3 4 core. I just went through the calculations. This has got 256 kilobytes. Each block is 64 bytes and the associativity is 8. So that is the total number of sets is going to be 2 raised to 18 divided by 2 raised to 6 divided by 2 raised to 3. That is 2 raised to 9. 2 raised to 9 is 512 uh, sets. So for each set, I looked at the maximum time to access a particular block in that set and I plotted this. And I was hoping to find, as per the attack, I was hoping to find those 64 blocks nicely on top over here, so I could at least identify where the AES tables are in cache. Unfortunately, I was unsuccessful. I can't see any plateau of 64, 64 sets. So 64 is about one eighth of 512. So one eighth of this graph should have seen a plateau of this sort, more or less contiguous because almost all of those blocks are accessed, but I don't see any of this. And the reason for that is because modern processors typically use something called prefetching. When there is a cache missed on a particular block, 
in anticipation of the use of the next block they also fetch that. So that has basically dashed my hopes of finding out. So the first step was to find out where the AES tables are in cache as the attacker. And unfortunately I cannot at least from this picture I cannot. So let us get back a little bit to what I am trying to do over here. So that when the victim starts to, uh, to execute AES from main memory there are these different elements of the T0, T1, T2 and T3 which I have now brought into cache. So the moment I start to access them and run these different rounds they will be brought into cache and I am talking about doing a complete encryption which is 10 rounds. So now visualize in this picture each of these things is actually a set each of these is a set and the set has got uh, 64 let us see 8 different elements inside the set. So So now visualize this not as a line but as a set there are 8 blocks per set this is L2 cache Now what happens is I bring the first line let us say in those tables again recall there are 4 tables T0, T1, T2, T3 each of these tables is 16 blocks so total of 64 blocks. So I bring the first element of T0 so let us suppose it is inside this set here now it can go anywhere inside that set then I bring the next element of T0 so this this element actually this is a set this whole thing is a set and this is a block so the block is of size 64 bytes which carries 16 elements of T0 so 16 elements over here now I need to access another block so let us suppose that will come here and so on and so forth not exactly in this order. so like this so I have a total of 64 uh, such things that I bring in 64 sets so this is one set another set another set etc for T0 so 16 such sets for T0 16 41 16 42 16 43 so in my first uh, so looking at the attack in pictures what I did was the first step was the attacker who has initialized an array which is about the size of this L2 cache actually it turns out to be larger than that for reasons I would not explain here. So he populates every single he accesses every single block inside this L2 cache. So this block this block and so on and so forth each block of this uh, cache is going to be accessed that is step 1 of the attack. Step 2 the uh, victim begins to execute AES and in, in so doing he needs to bring all these 4 things inside cache there are a total of 64 blocks and he brings them so the first block could be here for example the second block in the next set if you see if you understand how cache works it will be in this set first and then this set it need not be exactly below this it can be anywhere inside that set. So the next one here the next one here and so on and so forth. So he brings 16 of those things but not necessarily in this order of this then this then this whatever he needs to access based on those x0 values x1 values and so on. So he brings a total of these 64 and he puts them inside over here and then guess what happens the third step so now most of those 64 blocks as I said before statistically about 3 blocks will not be accessed. So most of those blocks now sit down inside here 64 contiguous things and then the third step is the attacker again starts to access each block of this. So he accesses each block 
and then he looks at the maximum time to access each block within a set and he takes that maximum and he plots that. So the maximum time to access each of these blocks, so access this block, access this block, access this block, take the maximum of them and plot it for this particular set. Then go to the next set, take the maximum for that set and plot it and so on and so forth. Now when you come to this set, he finds something very interesting because the victim has executed AES, a full execution of AES that is all 10 rounds, he must have brought this block, he must have brought this block and as a result when the attacker goes to access his array, the attacker goes to access his array, he will find that to access this block it takes more time. So the maximum of the access times is now elevated and we will see that in the graph. So for all of these contiguous 64 blocks you should see some elevation. So the first step for the attacker is to figure out where in main memory and in cache his T0, T1, T2, T3 exist. That is the first step. So we did this experiment and we plotted it and the results of the plot are in this slide. So when we uh, plotted it we actually got something like this which does not reveal anything and the reason for that is as I said before modern processors have this feature of prefetching, it is called hardware prefetching. If a block B is requested from main memory, B plus 1 is also prefetched in anticipation of its use. So even without requesting it, I prefetch it. So suppose there was a miss on block B, I bring this block, then uh, I also bring B plus 1 in anticipation that I might require B plus 1 in the very near future. This is hardware prefetching done by the processor to ensure better bus utilization. There is also something called software prefetching that is done by the compiler, but we are not going to talk about it here. So unfortunately, this greatly complicates the task of the attack. So when we tried to attack because of this, as you saw in the previous slide, we could not find any elevated region over here corresponding to the four AES tables. So that was bad news. We had to continue working and working and then we modified our uh, attack as follows. So now we do this, we iterate for each cache, cache set. How many cache sets are there? We just calculated for the Intel i3. There are 512 cache sets. For, for each cache set, we do the following. Access W blocks using the attacker's list of pointers that map to this cache set. So I just drew a picture. In each horizontal row, there were eight of these things. So I access each of these blocks, these W blocks, corresponding to the same cache set. So that is the first step. Then I allow the victim to go on. So he does the encryption, perform AES encryption to bring all those blocks amongst the 64 blocks into the cache that were used by the encryption. And then I go back to the attacker. The attacker accesses the W blocks which map to this particular set S prime. So he brought those uh, elements into the cache, those W elements. W is the associativity. Its value is equal to 8 in the case of the I3. So he brought those W blocks into cache. This guy starts the encryption, then he goes back and accesses those W blocks which map to the same set S prime. Record the maximum time taken to access the W blocks. So keep doing this experiment for all the S prime sets inside the L2 cache. S prime is equal to as we calculated 512 sets. And after we do this, we found that this was the graph. This modified attack, there was a slight plateau over here, almost all of them in the 64, uh, 64 set range were actually elevated access times. So the others were generally lower. Now there are some that are a little bit high over here, but those false positives are because of the operating system. The operating system and other processes are executing and because of those other processes, they bring their own, uh, this is dcache, don't forget. So there is iCache and dcache, separate caches on the Intel i3. So in the case of dcache, I'm sorry, this is a unified cache, we're talking about L2 actually. So in the case of L2, you will bring both data and instructions. So there are different instructions and there's different data corresponding to operating system processes and also some other processes that are running. So there is some amount of noise. But fortunately, if you put the browser off and you put other applications off to the extent you can, then you will be able to actually see this. This is a place where the four tables, T0, T1, T2, T3 are nicely sitting down. So once we know where the tables are, then the next step, as you would guess, is to find out which of those sets is not accessed. Once we know which sets are not accessed, then by some extremely complicated mathematics, which is in Shamir's paper, we can actually figure out 
which keys which could not be possible potential keys. So in other words we have reduced the space from 2 raised to 128 to around 2 raised to 48. So this was the first step on the Intel i3 finding out where exactly are those four tables in cache by just doing experiments we do not know anything about the uh, you know we cannot see the victims program we cannot figure out where his tables are this is a very indirect way of figuring out just measuring access times to figure out where his tables sit down in cache. We also did this experiment on Intel dual core there if you do the calculations L2 cache size and so on it turns out there are about 4096 uh, different sets and then we found the location of the AES cache those 64 um, sets strangely enough most of the time they were contiguous but sometimes those 64 sets were discontiguous. So if you look at the total number of this uh, sets over here if you just look at the x coordinate here and the x coordinate here the total number of sets here and the total number of sets here you will find that the total is 64. Now we try to understand why this was the case in about 10 percent of the cases these uh, T0, T1, T2, T3 were not contiguous in cache but actually split in this fashion. So we try to understand that and the reason for that is actually reasonably straightforward. So if you look at main memory T0, T1, T2, T3 will almost always be contiguous no problem with that each one is 1 kilobyte 4 kilobytes total. So they would occupy one page in general because each one is 256 bytes sorry 256 entries so 256 multiplied by 4 that is 1024 so 1 kilobyte. So 1 kilobyte 1 kilobyte 1 kilobyte 1 kilobyte now very often these would be aligned on a page boundary so this would be in one page very often however this would not be the case not very often but sometimes this would not be the case there would be split between two pages. So this is the page boundary and then the tables might be say here. between two pages. So this is the page boundary this is the page boundary. Now we know how virtual memory is mapped to physical memory. So this is virtual space the way this is mapped to physical memory is using a page table and this page might go to one particular page in main memory and there is no guarantee that this page maps necessarily to the next thing the way page, uh, page tables work is that this could map anywhere else. So this maps over here while this next page might map somewhere else altogether. So this goes over here that is the reason you see this thing not contiguous but discontiguous. So some part of the T0, T1, T2, T3 tables are here and some part are there at the beginning of this page. So this is the page boundary in physical memory main memory this is the page boundary this is the page boundary this is something else and RT0 begins over here for example T1 continues T2 is partly here and partly there and T3 is here that is the reason why the two things appear discontiguous because of paging. So this is the first part of the attack to figure out where the AES tables lie. And then once we figure out where they lie out of those 64 lines or 64 blocks in T0, T1, T2, T3 we figure out which blocks were not accessed approximately 3 to 4 blocks will not be accessed figuring out which blocks are not accessed will enable me to get valuable hints through some very complicated mathematics which takes about 3 pages I can figure out which um, by figuring out which blocks out of those 64 were not accessed I can uh, get valuable clues as to what may not be a candidate key. So I can eliminate some keys from that 2 raised to 128 space I can bring it down to around 2 raised to 48 and once I brought it down to 2 raised to 48 then I can laptop for example I can spend a day or so 
in actually obtaining the rest of the key. So this was a known plain text attack. Okay, so that is the I have also talked about this last time, so I won't repeat it. Uh, these are some of the projects that we are doing, and since some of the participants had specifically requested that we talk about some research directions and what is going on over here, in addition to doing the basic stuff on the basic course, we spent about two or three sessions talking about some of the uh, research directions that we are pursuing out here. So with that, I conclude this discussion.